This is a going back, remembering UGA interview with UGA alumnus and editor-publisher of Georgia Trend Magazine, Neely Young. Today is November 14th, 2013. We are in the conference room of the Ray Nicholson House on the University of Georgia campus. Others with us include Alice Vernon and videographer Bill Evelyn, members of the Going Back crew, and I'm Fran Lane. Welcome, Neely. Thank you. Thank you very much. We are very glad to have the chance to visit with you today, and, and let's start at the beginning. Uh, you're a Cedartown, Georgia boy. Grew up in Cedartown, born and raised there. My family was uh, settled the town, the area, down in 1833 after the Cherokee Land Lottery, a little community called Young Station, which is south of Cedartown, and moved to town in 1908. Uh, my, my grandfather was president of the bank, and did, had, a, had a pretty good sized farm. They didn't call them plantations, but he had about a 4,000 acre farm south of Cedartown. And back in those days, you did a little bit of everything. He had some real estate and he had the John Deere dealership. And, and uh, so I had a very good history of a, of a, of a tradition in Cedartown. I was going to ask you what life was like for a boy growing up in small town Georgia in the late 40s, early 50s. Oh, it was wonderful. You know, we would have uh, you know everything. We we moved. We moved, we lived in a town in on Victoria Avenue, and two blocks to the west of us was Peaks Park, and it had a swimming pool and tennis courts, clay, the old clay tennis courts. And during the summers, I'd get on my bicycle and ride there, and that's where I stayed all summer, playing tennis and swimming. And then the uh, elementary school, then the middle school, and the high school were two blocks the other way. And so Cedartown High School was just two blocks from my other house. And back in those days when you were 14, 15, you'd ride your bicycles everywhere. Nobody cared. You know, you couldn't do that today anywhere. But uh, you'd ride up to Main Street, and the West Theater was right there. For 25 cents, you could go to the movie. And Moore's Corner was right on the, on the corner. Uh, I was telling you a little bit about the ancestors. We had a huge number of people that were young. So there used to be a joke, you could stand on Moore's Corner in Cedartown and throw a rock and you'd hit a, a relative of mine. So I couldn't get in any trouble too much because all my relatives were school teachers. And if I did anything wrong, it'd be right back to my mother and father right away. Your mama knew before you got home. <laughs> That's, <laughs> That's true. And a uh, great tradition there. Foot, football was a real big thing in Cedartown. And, and I, I was uh, on that questionnaire, it says, who influenced your life? And most of the time, you know, your mother and father are your main influences, but a lot of the times your people that are maybe in the school system or in big influence on my life was uh, Coach Doc Ayers. I played, played for Doc, and he, he was a coach at Cedartown High School, and a great character, motivator. He could believe, he'd make you believe in any, you could do anything. And I think that's what inspired me, I guess, to, to go on and do some other things. It was uh, the confidence he would he'd give to you. He was a great character. He, one story a, a player told that after I was in school that Doc uh, would, would play these, he'd really get you fired up during the halftime, if we, especially if you were behind. And, he uh, he went into the lock, went into the where the kids were all in the gym during the halftime, and we were getting beat, and everybody was kind of down. And he he brought out these roses, and he says, "You see these roses? By gosh, so they sent them to me this morning." And my wife opened them up, and it said, "Jones High School, we're going to bury you." Boy, and he was so mad, and we they all charged out, you know, and won the game. And someone said they'd seen Doc that afternoon going to the flower shop and coming out with the roses. <laughs> but he certainly could motivate a, you. A real motivator. <laughs> well, now, Neely, you went to Darlington. Right. I went up there. Uh, in Rome. To, in Rome, Georgia, uh, hoping I could play football, go off and play for Auburn or somewhere. And I, uh, that was my main motivation to go up there and uh, not to study, of course. <laughs> and, uh, and I got hurt up there. I had my shoulder knocked out of joint and those other things, so that kind of ruined my football career. But I did love to play football. And Darlington is a great school, and I still associate with them. I've given some talks to students over there in the past. And Doing some motivating yourself. <laughs> yeah, that's trying to. But you finished at Cedartown, right? Finished at Cedartown High School, that's right. And then I went to Shorter for a short time and then came over to the University of Georgia. You got here in the fall of 62, does that sound right? I think that's right, yes. Huh? What did the campus 
look like when you got here in 1962? What physical aspects of the campus stand Well, out? Lumpkin Street was, uh, was huge, and there's uh, the old ho Georgian hotels where I, I, I roomed, and I didn't know anybody uh, when I came over here. Most everybody from Cedartown was being close to the Alabama line, went to Auburn, or went over there. So I, so I uh, stayed up in a little hotel room and ran, had some guys from Columbus, Georgia, were there, Bill Huff and some other guys, and they were rooming right down from me, and I got to be buddies with them. And I remember Lumpkin Street so much because that's where all the fraternities were. So I was uh, rushed by several of the fraternities, uh, SA and, and Chi Phi. Chi Phi is a big Rome town and has some great friends from you know, Cedar Town in Rome. And then, uh, but I, I was uh, kind of seduced by the Robert E. Lee crowd. You know, they, Kappa they were the Kappa Alpha. <laughs> and, uh, they, used to, they had a, a big cheer. How many Yankees were there? 10,000. How many Rebs? Three. What are we going to do? Charge. <laughs> <laughs> and heard that one. So, and the guys that were from Columbus were KAs, and that's, that's what I, I wound up joining was a Kappa Alpha. And it's a great fraternity, it still is now. But it's not here anymore. Of course, they, they uh, torn down right. Lumpkin Street, all, most of the fraternities. Street. And they've moved over, and I've, I've helped them with that, that endeavor a little bit. But um, Did you live, well, you lived at the Georgian Hotel the whole time? You no, moved no, into just, the just that, that, that uh, quarter, and then I moved into the fraternity house and stayed there a lot in just different places around. That was an experience, I'm sure. Fond memory is uh, uh, Dean Tate. Of course, everybody loves Dean Tate, and, uh, and I got in some trouble. We, we, we went to summer school and got in a little trouble off campus by some of my fraternity brothers were, had a party, and uh, Tick Atkinson, my roommate from, uh, from Noonan, Georgia, and I, were, we went home that weekend, but we came back, and, and uh, my brothers got in a little bit of trouble, so had to go before Dean Tate, and uh, we were just still, you know, first year over here, green as grass, and, he quizzed us about what were you doing with these boys, these rowdy boys, and we didn't know anything. You know, we weren't even, weren't even there, you know, so he put us in Reed Hall on, uh, said, well, you boys got to move in the Reed Hall, but he was good to us. And I just remember him being such a uh, kind person, you know. Uh, sure. He kind of saw that we were not in you know, any troublemakers, and uh, so he, that was our punishment. We had to move to Reed Hall for the rest of the summer, <laughs> and it was hot. <laughs> <laughs> and I bet, Neely, he knew who you were every time he saw you. After oh, that, yes, he? yes. Oh, gosh, yes. He'd remember your name and everything. How are you, Mr. Young? You know, <laughs> he would say. Where'd you eat? Well, we ate in the fraternity house, and uh, we had, uh, uh, you know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner at the fraternity house. Great cooks. Real good cooks, and... Uh, Ran around with some uh, some of the football players, and uh, we'd go out and uh, once a week we would have a barbecue eating contest. Who could eat the most barbecue? And so we had all these great restaurants around there, barbecue restaurants around Athens. So we would go to a barbecue restaurant and order, especially if it was all you could eat for like three dollars. And uh, I had this roommate, Buddy Coleman, little old bitty guy, and he could out eat anybody. And we had these big old beefy guys, you know, on the football team, and he would always win. He'd eat three and four plates of barbecue. <laughs> I guess Posses saw y'all a good bit, right? Posses saw us a lot, that's right. How'd you get around? Well, we walked and then I had a car my, my last two years. And uh, we, we would, you know, just walk around. Everything was pretty close. I remember the girls uh, so different today, you know, we would go to the football games in coat and tie. And uh, the girls would all dress up real nice and everything. And then if they were wore shorts, they had to wear a raincoat or, or, around them to walk to gym and stuff like that. And then you had to have the girls in at, uh, during, during uh, the week at 10 o'clock, it was hell to pay. And signing then, in and signing out. That's right, they had to sign in and sign out. They didn't trust us fellows very much. Well, I tell you, times have changed, haven't they? <laughs> Rightly so, they didn't trust us. <laughs> How did you look? You know, I, I, it's funny, I don't ask everybody that, but I, I, it dawned on me the other day as I was looking through some old material that Folks who were here in the late '60s looked a lot different from the way folks looked in the oh, early '60s. Oh yeah, we 60s. were we were the. I was there, you know, and in in, uh, it was. I, I have not changed my dress, Fran. I look at this. I've got, I've got a button down. This we used to have Gantt shirts, blue sport coat, striped tie, Georgia tie, khaki pants. I don't have Weegans on, but I've got something similar. I vote for you. <laughs> and that's the way we dressed. Right. And the crew cuts. I mean, just about everybody had a crew cut. Clean a buzz, cut. You know, clean cut. 
And uh, you know, we miss the mini skirts and all this. <laughs> <Work Uh-oh. in. laughs> well, you majored in business. Right, uh, I was telling you a little earlier, I had uh, I, my family owned the Valdosta Daily Times and I was on my mother's side and I'd go down there in the summers and uh, hardest darn work in the world. And uh, boy, you know, I was in photography mainly, but I also was a printer's devil and we'd be back there. And the pay was $35 a week. So I said, well, I'm not going to do this, you know. So I, I got into business school and uh, got an economics general business degree. And when I graduated, uh, I got a job at Lockheed Aircraft in engineering. And uh, the business school prepared me well. And they were, I was the only business school graduate. Everybody else was from Tech and you know, from uh, Auburn and uh, Clemson. You know, the, uh, the engineers. engineers. And uh, so I, I was able to pass all the exams they've got, really, I guess, through my training from the business school. And uh, I was there about uh, nine months, and we were making $200 a week, which in 1966 was a Big lot of money. Bucks. And, uh, and so I went back down to Valdosta, and, and uh, they wanted me to come back down there, be in the family, and they said, this is a family business, we need you to come back down. So they, so they didn't know what I was making in that. They told me, they said, well, we're going to stretch this out. We're going to pay you $50 a week. <laughs> I said, $50 a week? I'm making 200 a week. Well, they didn't believe me. 200 a week? <laughs> so I went back, and I said, I just can't believe him. I'd met, uh, my wife was there and when I first started at Lockheed as a summer hire, and uh, Kathy, and she was, uh, she was over here in Athens. So I was, you know, living in Marietta, working at Lockheed and coming over and, and dating her. And uh, she, uh, they called me back down to Valdosta and said, we'll match your salary. So, so that sounded pretty good. And Lockheed at the time had 33,000 employees and I just saw myself being in an ant hill and I said, well, I don't know if I want to do this for the rest of my life. I wanted to work somewhere where you can make an impact. And uh, smaller companies, you can do, you can make a bigger impact. So I went back down there and uh, Kathy and Kathy and I became engaged and uh, she, fin- she came down with me to Valdosta and she finished at Valdosta State College. So I robbed the cradle. She well, was a, uh, well, uh, she's four years younger than I am. So well, just, we've been married just a, just 30, a baby. 37 years marriage. <laughs> <laughs> I just, just say uh, it turned out okay. Memorable faculty or staff when you were here, but uh, Dean, you've mentioned Dean Tate. Dean Tate, and I remember so much, he taught me, taught me the uh, class, you know, and then I had, you know, I can't remember a lot of my, my teachers. Uh, one was an English teacher, and I have a horrible handwriting. I was in the business school, but you'd have to go through and take English course, and I just, uh, nobody could read my writing. I wish we'd had computers, and I still, still got horrible handwriting. But he would uh, take my papers and uh, read them in class, so I must have had a little bit of talent. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know, when, uh, but I would get a C because my handwriting and everything was so bad. <laughs> and that hardly seems fair. He liked what you wrote. I know it. That's true. That's true. Well, yeah, and you're right. Dean Tate was an English. That's where he started in the English department, I think. What about campus characters, Neely? Were there some folks that just well, you know, uh, everybody had, you know, every, we had some real characters in some the Some you can't tell about, sure. I'm that's sure. Right. That's, that's all right. <laughs> we had this fellow, uh, we, we would have, a, have our Old South Ball, and uh, I don't mind, he, I guess he won't mind me telling this, but Carlisle Overstreet, and he, uh, he's from Augusta, and he had, I don't know if he had flunked out, but he wasn't in school, and so Dean Tate's assistant had came over to our house right before, and uh, he was getting on us, we were being too loud or something, and so this fellow just chewed him out, says, you don't need to come over here, so we're gonna be, you know, so-and-so, and so he said, well, I'm putting y'all on probation, so it sounded like Animal House, but we weren't quite that bad, but, so we got on probation and didn't get to have Old South, so I still have the mug, and that's, that's Judge Carlisle over in <laughs> Augusta now. <laughs> he came back to Georgia and has a distinguished career. <laughs> But he was a character, and then we had a fellow, P.B. Patterson, and gosh knows where he is. He, he was in school over here for like 20 years, and uh, he, he was like in his 30s, and he was in the K house with us. And, Every uh, group had one of those, <laughs> didn't they? At least one. Just couldn't and, get away. And Bat Barnado, Gordon Barnado was uh, Batman. He walked around in a Batman outfit, and uh, he was older. And he hadn't changed. He's still, he's in Savannah, and uh, he still wears his Batman <laughs> outfit. 
And we, we all thought he was the greatest, coolest guy he was, that there ever was. And uh, so we had some great characters. I want to talk a little bit about extracurricular and social life in a minute, but uh, the early 60s were certainly a turbulent time in, in our country, and, and the issues of the times certainly impacted us at the university. Of course, Charlene, Hunter Galt, and Hamilton Holmes had integrated the university in the winter in January of 1961, but I wondered, was desegregation, how did desegregation affect just uh, just normal student life? Did you, did you, was it something in your consciousness or was it just, you just, we were sort of the halls of ivy and it just didn't Im I would on. say, well, my parents were very uh, liberal on race and Cedartown, North Georgia didn't have a lot of, a uh, lot of African American issues. Uh, it didn't have very many people up in the mountains, you know, didn't even really want to uh, go to war uh, back in 1860. So when I was here, uh, we didn't see them very much. It, it wasn't an issue. I, 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 they, they had come like two years before or maybe the year before I got to Georgia. So, but everybody accepted it. Now there was a big political race and Goldwater was a big hero for everybody and I was a Lyndon Johnson man. Me and about three other KAs out of the 130 members we had. I don't think we have too many more members in KA than we had back then. But we had a big chapter but uh, so we had a lot of political debates. But not about race so much. I, people were people were accepting of race. I, I don't remember that being an issue. Uh, I, I, when I went to, to work at the Ballast of Times, it was down there, and my cousin Tenny Griffin was the editor. And I, when I went down there, and, and we had a lot of stories about the racial effects of, uh, of what was integration in Valdosta. But uh, I, I don't don't think it was too big a thing. It was more Goldwater against Johnson and. Uh, you know, and, and going to war. Vietnam had just started, it was you know, a blip on the radar, but we had a, a, a Mike Calhoun uh, was shot down over there, and that was kind of a big shock. That uh, we didn't know anything, nobody even heard of Vietnam. Kennedy was president, and then the biggest thing that happened to me in my life was uh, Kennedy was shot, and I was in English class, and uh, the lady came in and says, our president's been shot, and what a shock that was. It was on a Friday afternoon, I, I remember, and uh, we we all came back to the Kaya house and, you know, everybody was really mournful for that and watched it on television and watched the, you know, I went home to Cedartown and uh, this is one of those things you remember where you were. You know, I was in English class over here at the University of Georgia, uh, right across from the journalism school. I think you're right. I think those of us that were of that era Everybody knows exactly where you were when you heard the news and, and, and what had happened. And now, 50th year anniversary, we're seeing a lot of that again. It it's all on television. That's what I watched the show on it last night. Hard to, hard to let it go. I read an article that said that the baby boomers can't let it go. Yeah. It, just, it continues to, to have an effect. And I think part of that was that the president had had such an effect on, for example, I have a close friend who said President Kennedy was the biggest influence in her life in terms of what direction she took, so. Well, he was youthful and he was, uh, you know, we had Eisenhower who was kind of an older man and that's what usually you would think of as a president and had these wonderful ideas and ideals and, uh, you know, the, the new frontier, we went to the moon, you know, had all these visions and uh, was a great, great uh, 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 civil rights leader in his own way and so all that was going on kind of while he was there but uh, one thing about Georgia that people don't remember that uh, when Charlene and, and uh, Hamilton came over here is uh, in Alabama the, the, in Arkansas and Mississippi all the, the governors stood stood at the gates and said you can't come in and shut them down it was a big huge thing where our governor at the time uh, he, he sent the state patrol over here to, to escort them to keep them safe. It was a big difference, and I think that's one reason that I remember us being accepting of, uh, of the race issue over in Athens. And Georgia, since that time, has always been open, and uh, more, more so than Birmingham, where they had their guard dogs out. And we were, we were actually trying to integrate the schools in a peaceful way in which we did. We, uh We've had a chance to talk with Betty Russell Vandiver, and it was quite an experience, yeah. but very. Well, he took a lot of he took a lot of guts for what he did, and he he also Martin Luther King was thrown in the Cab County Jail, and Bobby Kennedy called up 
Governor Vanderman says, can you get him out of jail? He made a phone call to the judge. It was on a trumped up charge and they got Martin Luther King out of jail in DeKalb County. That wouldn't have happened over in Birmingham. Right. Or, or in, anywhere else in South Carolina. So that's a little known story, but uh, Vandenberg kind of maybe committed polit political suicide right. by doing that, but still he was one of the great Georgians because he ushered in the civil rights area. And look what happened to Georgia compared to Birmingham. Atlanta and Birmingham were the same size in 19, late 1950s. And now Atlanta boomed and became an open city and we have the, the Braves and the Falcons and, and the Birmingham stayed behind. Right. So it was a big difference. Right. We were I blessed with leadership, and that's true. Let's go back and talk a little bit about extracurricular life. Um, and certainly, I, Greek life at the time was very important. Um, and we can talk a little bit more about that, but talk a little bit about campus politics. Do you remember how it worked? Well, it was mainly controlled by the Greeks. And, uh, you know, the Greek system controlled everything. And then uh, a good, real close friend of mine right now, Buddy Darden, came over. And he was a GDI. Uh, a goddamn independent, you know, that's what they call yeah. themselves. And, uh, and uh, he ran for president and won. And that was a big breakup of the Greek system in Athens. I was just reading over in Alabama, they call it, at the University of Alabama, they call it the machine. And they've had a lot of, lot of uh, news on the New York Times and everything. The machine decided to run somebody for, against a black man from the Tuscaloosa uh, city council and they put up a student I think and ran him and he won <laughs> and, uh, so and then the, you know they've had a big controversy about that whether the fellow the person that won really lived in Tuscaloosa was just a student lived outside and they so you know a lot of college campuses in the south the, the, uh, the Greeks still control everything and I'm not sure how it is today but Buddy Darden kind of broke that and uh, in, a, in a nice way it wasn't a violent or anything way but uh, uh, it was a Things were softer times, you know, before the Vietnam War uh, became on the scene and riots and things when I was, I was in school. You got out just in time. I did, so, that's right. <laughs> talk a little bit about big events on campus when, when the whole campus came together, uh, homecoming and Oh yeah, football kind of would be big, that's right. You know, and we, uh, and we had uh, our biggest rival was uh, Auburn and, and not Tech. And, uh, I was there, we, I was here during Johnny Griffith era and everything was kind of dull, you know, we kind of, you know, we would, uh, we'd go to the, go to the uh, football games and we had one season and I was here, we, we went three, three and four or something, you know, we tied three games and we would go for the tie instead of going for the two point conversion and everything and so, I mean, they were so dull so we would make, uh, we'd take the programs and make paper airplanes and throw them out, you know, and <laughs> you see that's going everywhere, you know. <laughs> and, uh, had to entertain yourself. That's right, and we had, uh, I don't remember getting, having whiskey too much there, but it was there, you know, in the stands. You could you could pass a bottle up and down and have a, have a drink if you wanted to. Sneak it in. You couldn't get whiskey too much. It was pretty hard to get, you know, so we, we Talk were. Talk about that, has Arcade come to mind? Arcade, you know, we'd, that was a big run and you go up to South Carolina. Uh, strangely enough, you know, uh, we were pretty self-policing uh, in, in the KA house. You know, we didn't we didn't drink too much. You know, we we would uh, we had keg parties and things like that. But uh, we had a house mother, uh, Mrs. D. I can't remember her last name, and she. You know, we always stayed pretty straight. You know, my paternity is uh, the, the slogans for God and women. So we always helped put women <laughs> on a pedestal and. Uh, and we really did. <laughs> I had never changed. heard that about the Kappa Alphas. <laughs> That's good to know. <laughs> and we would, we would have our old South with Auburn. And we would go to, to Atlanta, uh, the ones that we, we went on probation for. And uh, not Tech, we didn't care much for Tech, but Emory and, and uh, Auburn and uh, Georgia KAs would have the old South together. And when we played Auburn, we'd all hang out to the K house in Auburn and they'd hang out with us. And uh, we, we had some real good friends there. Describe Old South for somebody who maybe has never heard of it or, or known about how it. Uh, we were, we were uh, just, we had cl classes in Robert E. Lee's philosophy and uh, he, he was, uh, you know, the, he retired to Washington Lee University and that's, uh, they formed the KA chapter there. 
and we were the Gamma chapter. We were, you know, pretty pretty close in. And uh, he he was always a, the gentleman and a gentleman scholar. And you were taught we taught each other to stand up when ladies entered the room and say yes, ma'am, and no, sir, to to the uh, older people. And uh, Robert E. Lee was uh, was didn't believe in slavery. Uh, we were taught that, and he thought uh, he was the, the main reasons that, that the North and the South got back together as he said, put down your arms and we're going to accept uh, slavery, uh, the end of slavery. So you know, one story was that uh, when he was became, when an older man, he was in his ragged uniform up in Richmond and the Episcopal Church was there and the blacks always sat up in the back and the whites were in the front and they never, the whites took communion down front and they just gave the communion in the back. and so. There was a group in this church, and this uh, black man came down and sat at the altar and took communion. And everybody went, <gasps> and this older gentleman got up, white hair, and went down and sat with him, took communion with him. And that was Robert E. Lee. So that made a big impression on me and my journalism career, too. Very interesting. For Old South, you wore a Confederate uniform? Oh, yeah, we'd, we would. Uh, We'd wear a Confederate uniform, and the girl, the dates would have the hoop skirts, and uh, we would go over and ser we had a serenade. We didn't do the horses. I think they've done some things differently, but uh, uh, we didn't do the horses. But we we would go. We had we would go down to the different sorority houses and uh, serenade them, sing pretty poorly probably, <laughs> <laughs> in our Confederate uniforms, and uh, then we would have the Old South ball, and we usually had it in Atlanta, and we had these great bands. You know the the bands Little Richard and all these people that became famous, they were just, you know, they were just uh, bands from North Carolina, you know, Sister Rose and the Cornelius Brothers, and uh, we'd have these fantastic bands and uh, have cocktail parties before and, and then, you know, probably take the dates in kind of late and uh, then go back to where we were, where we were staying in these motel hotels and uh, party all night. And it was just a lot of fun. Great times. And, and uh, we would carry the Confederate flags around. I know we don't have the Confederate flag, flag as a, of a flag of pride as we used to, but uh, back then, it wasn't, it wasn't considered, a, you know, it was considered more a parochial thing. That we were the South and, and we fought against the Yankees. We weren't fighting against slavery, but that's what we were, we were uh, thought, and probably some people would disagree with that, but, uh, but that was our fraternity's motto is that we accepted slavery and Robert E. Lee did. Again, not slavery, but accepted the freedom of the slaves. Homecoming, I know you had some big entertainers show up. Do you remember who came or? Yeah, we, we, we would have, uh, you know, that would be, uh, we'd watch and watch all the, all the old guys come in, you know, and we'd, uh, uh, that was a lot of fun. One fellow named Wiley Waller would come and he was a real character and he, he was from my hometown, Cedartown, and he, he liked to get on the phone and call the hotel and, and like at 10 at night and say, I think you have some illicit activities going on in this hotel and I'm offended. I'm in room 607 and I'm calling the police. <laughs> and he would get the, get the man on the phone in the hotel, you know, manager all upset. Work, so, what do you mean we're not having any illicit <laughs> activities? Just go down to room 607 and see, you know. And, and he'd come back and he, he did play all these tricks on people. That was one of many. <laughs> And we'd sit around and watch him, you know, so you could put on a show. And a lot of, a lot of the, you know, we, we uh, a lot of, uh, Bat Barnado was one of the ones I was talking about, Batman, he, he came back, <clears throat> he graduated about 10 years before, but he would come in and be just one of us, and we all loved that. Did you all go in for all the, the float making or for the big old things out in the front yard that you had oh, yeah, chicken we put, wire? Oh yeah, and... chicken wire. We weren't really big into that, but, uh, you know, but we had, uh, uh, we, oh, we the, girls the, the girls were the shorty. The girls did all big that. Yeah. Chicken wire <laughs> things and bulldogs and. I remember the, everybody dressing so much alike. Uh, the, we you had the Gantt shirts and Madras Madras shirts, and Madras coats and uh, khaki pants, you know, and Wigeons and and London fog jackets. Uh, everybody, you'd go in an IK house. Be, everybody would have a London fog jacket on. That was, and I had. Uh, I was so proud of my Madras. Uh, 
sport coat. And it had to be washed a little bit so it faded and right. bled and everything. Absolutely. And uh, oh, I was up in Dalton uh, 10 years later and my wife was, was uh, she had a yard sale. And so I came out there and that mattress coat was there and this lady was buying it. And I said, wait a minute, I didn't, I didn't want you to buy that coat. I said, what, that, uh, what, what are you gonna do with that? She said, oh, I'm a clown. <laughs> I'm gonna wear this clown outfit. Hurt my feelings. Oh, <laughs> oh. that is a blow. Huh. Um, I, I, we had referenced the fact that there may be some favorite stories that probably go better un, untold. Are there any that we've we've missed out on? That your favorite UGA anecdotes? Oh my gosh. Uh, well, we we had uh, just all the all the old stories. Uh, actually, some of them I can't tell. I guess. Well, absolutely. <laughs> but my, our senator Saxby Chambliss, I didn't know him there, but this is sort of a typical thing. Is I had a young lady interview him about four years ago, and he said, uh, you know, she said, well, well, I guess you were in the Beta Club, or you know, you were in the in the top top of your class, and you were did you did all these exterior activities? And he said, well, I didn't want to tell her I was running whiskey from South Carolina because <laughs> I was a social chairman, Sigma Chi. Oh, my. <laughs> Destroy her <Whoa>. illusions. <laughs> well, that, that. well, we didn't drink too heavy. I mean, it was, uh, you know, I, 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 got, I got lots of cop eye stories. You know, one, one cop eye friend of mine stole the Greyhound bus over here and dry, drove it in the snow through Atlanta get, trying to get back to Rome to see oh, his girlfriend. Oh my goodness, I hadn't heard that one. <laughs> when I said up a Tamage was a Kai-Fi, wasn't he? Wasn't Herman Tamage a Kai-Fi and there was no, another? No, I don't think he was a Kai-Fi. Carl Sanders was a Kai-Fi back before our time. But the story about the piano being rolled down Lumpkin Street, they, is that they an had old a, they, urban legend? The alumni leg? had given them, given them a piano and uh, this, was in the, this was in the late mid 50s and when they, they had all these guys that came back from the Korean War, you know, and they were all over there and they, they guys started playing the piano and they got all drunk and they said let's have a bonfire so they drug the, the, the uh, piano grand piano out on, on the street out there and and all the K's and everybody came up there and they were they set it on fire and they were drinking beers and a leg would fall and everybody would cheer you know Golly. <laughs> where was Dean Tate <laughs> he was probably watching <laughs> I guess the KAs were kind of a staid bunch compared to the Kai I'm getting ready to say <laughs> in that neighborhood. But I, I did have this one friend. He, we were the, we had top three floors in uh, John Fowler, and he he was up on the top floor, and he had too much to drink, and he fell all the way down. Oh the my gosh! Floor. <laughs> and he landed on a beer bottle, and they had to take him to the hospital because his rear end got got all chopped up. <laughs> We, well, we've heard about possums being put in people's rooms and, and causing consternation. And, and uh, it seems like to me I heard a couple of stories about somebody letting some baby chicks out in the K.A. house. Does that we sound had a, We had a duck. Uh, we brought a duck over there, and Durwood the duck, and he was a little bitty duck. And we raised that duck to be in it. Until he got big. grown. Yeah. And he, he went with us everywhere. He thought he was human. And he was at, we'd come to our parties, and he'd be down, and the girls would go talk to Durwood. <laughs> <laughs> Those of you who are younger who listen to this, take note. You're the, the leadership of your country. Oh, nearly anything else that you think about about your days at the university before I move on a little bit into later times, or? Well, just just a lot of fun, and you don't didn't really appreciate it. I don't want to people really appreciate the college. You know, you don't really have any responsibility except studying, and uh, which is you know is hard enough and. Uh, I was, uh, I, I got out of the business school. I should have been in journalism. I should have been in journalism, but I, I don't know, I, was, I, I didn't think about going back into journalism. So uh, the Lockheed job was a great job. And I had, when I got out of school, I had like six or seven job offers, really good jobs. Uh, you know, so. People would kill the day for that. You oh, know, I know what, you don't have that today at all. I mean, I had, I could have gone into, into uh, working for, had a big insurance company wanted to hire me. Uh, they got the IBM was going to give me a job uh, for the and the IBM had a big office in Atlanta. I don't know what would have happened if I'd gone to work for them. I'd been moving everywhere. Uh, just just a Kraft Foods had had sales jobs. Uh, so everywhere I went, I'd got a job offer. You know, so it was uh, Lockheed was the best job. 
That was a great time. Yeah, that was, it was a great, a great time great in the country, time. economically, wasn't it? We were it, building so? the C5A at Lockheed, and that was the biggest reason. They had 33,000 employees, all high-paying positions. Mm -hmm. Times have changed. They have changed, yeah. Well, we, you talked a little bit already about your first job with Lockheed and then life after the university and, and what led you into journalism. It was a family business and they needed you. Right, that's right. What, what did you, at your high salary, what did you start as at the Valdosta Daily Times? Well, they, they, paid me, they paid me the 200 a week and, uh, you know, so I, I went on from there and I, uh, they, they, t they told me they would, they add the, the, uh, the uh, business manager was going to retire, and so I was going to get that job as business manager. And uh, so the, the job they had, I, so I started off in photography, and I did that, and then I worked in ads, and I worked in the uh, composing room some, and and then then uh, they had a position open, and we sold the company uh, to Thompson Newspapers, and I was ambitious, and Kathy and I had, had our first child. We 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 were there five years during the Baysmore times. I've always been very lucky in my career to be around newspapers where we're a real good football town. I'll say right baseball. Right baseball, the great right baseball. Five Bays million ball game. That's right, and uh, they were they were, and and just, I'll tell a little integration story. Uh, right baseball pretty much made Valdosta High School work when they integrated, and they had a, a player there named Lightning on the football team, the only black kid, and so I had. Uh, uh, we were playing Marietta for the state championship. I think this is 1967, and this kind of broke the ice. He was a, he was one of the. They just had a few kids that were in the school, and it was a lot of some tension. And uh, he caught. Uh, and I got this real good friend that just said uh, well, he sat next to me during that game, and he says, "Oh, I hate blacks. I hate blacks. I just can't believe he's on the team. I just can't believe it. I hate him." Well, that little boy caught up in the second half. We were behind. And seven, six to nothing. He caught the the uh, kickoff and ran 98 yards for a touchdown. And my friend says, "I'm taking him to dinner." <laughs> <laughs> different days, different days. And that kind of, and they had it on Mary. You know, back in those days, the Journal Constitution that was a big deal, high school football. And they had it on the front of the sports page and said the headline said, "Lightning struck." Because <laughs> <laughs> Bell lost won the game. It seemed yeah, like to me, I went to Athens High School, and it seemed like to me we ended up playing Valdosta just about every other year. Oh, yeah, the gosh, some of the greatest football games ever. You know, that Andy Johnson, when yeah, he right, was there, they were right. tie. I was, I was there at that game. That was a great football and, game. And, but it was hard to beat Valdosta, I'll tell you that. All right, from Valdosta, you went to Dalton, is that right? Davis? Right, they had this company, Thompson Newspaper, they had an opening up there, and uh, so I, I went up there and uh, uh, and kept brought Kathy, and we worked there for two years. Uh, built a home that was in the boom time, so the carpet industry was just booming. And so I had uh, had had some good fraternity brothers up there. My KA has been such a big blessing, just a major blessing for me. And I, everywhere we've moved in, in Georgia, we've run into fraternity brothers. And uh, this uh, friend of mine, Jimmy Fordham, he he was. Uh, Kind of a character himself, and he they had me on the front page just coming to the Daily Citizen News. And he looked at that and told his wife, Rita, Gosh, that's Neil Young, he can't hold a job. <laughs> a good friend. <laughs> well, he really was He's my best friend, you know. So we wound up being real good friends with them. And uh, another friend, Morris Sponsor, Betty Sponsor. And you want to get into my career a little bit, I left uh, Dalton and went down to Marietta, Georgia. Uh, I got an offer to go to Chicago with this company to be a, a, kind of an area person up there and a vice president job and be over the in the whole chain and I didn't want to move up to Chicago so I turned him down and so Otis Brumby is uh, he was a, a fraternity brother from Marietta and he his family had the Marietta, Marietta Daily Journal so so I, I left Dalton and went down to work for him and uh, and he bought the Cherokee Tribune up in Canton Georgia and I got to go up there as my first uh, editor publisher's job. And poor my poor wife, I was dragging her all over the place. <laughs> and uh, so we went up there to Canton, and that was one of my great, great uh, uh, memories, is being up there an editor and publisher of a weekly newspaper. And you did everything. You worked 70 hours a week, and you wrote the headlines, and you took classified ads during the city council meeting, somebody to hand you, when one of the councilmen said, here's a classified ad, I want to sell something, you know. And, 
And uh, people would come in and want to know, have a prescription to the newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I took the pictures, I laid it out, I watched it being produced and took it up and put it out in the racks and dealers just took it up to the post office. And it was a great experience. I, we were up there like four and a half years. And, uh, and, and uh, kids got on up there and then, then I got a call to be publisher of the Daily Citizen News in Dalton to go back there by this company. So that's what I did, went back up there and I stayed in Dalton about 12 years with, uh, and raised my family there. So all my real close friends are still, a lot of my close friends are still from Dalton that we still see and everything. Neely, you wrote a most informative editorial for Georgia Trend in June of this year entitled Alive and Well about the newspaper business. Oh, talk to us a little bit about that, would you? Well, you know, with all the technology and everything that's happening, uh, the classifieds business kind of went away from uh, from newspapers and it a bit hurt them, but newspapers are doing fine now. The ones that are that are doing the coverage, uh, little league baseball, uh, weddings, uh, high school football teams, uh, the social life, uh, covering the city council. Your local stuff. Local stuff. It, they're doing fine, and they're not just they're just not making the big money they used to make. Uh, one time, it, newspapers got where they were the only game in town, monopoly. They could just print money, but they certainly make a nice profit, and where some of the papers have gotten in trouble, the big change is they borrowed a whole lot of money, and they, they, then the business kind of went south, so uh, that's where the, a lot of, you've seen some of the bankruptcies and things, but that's, but that's because the cash flow went down, but the cash flow is still there, and so a lot of the weekly newspapers, the smaller dailies are, are being more and more successful. And the Journal Constitution in Atlanta they become a local newspaper. They're not statewide anymore. They cover 13 counties and uh, they've been able to do fine. So it's, it's uh, and also the internet is not as powerful as everybody thinks. 50% of the country doesn't have high speed internet and it's not gonna have high speed internet. It's too expensive to lay the cable. Uh, so it's not as pervasive as people think. You can't, if you go up into the mountains, you're not gonna get a high speed internet or if you, especially go out west, but if you're going to, you know, drive down to Savannah, you aren't going to have it a good bit on the, on the way going down there. So there, there's some limitations. And then the business model on, on the web is it's all free, so it's hard to make money off of it. Uh, you, you'll see people trying to make money, but uh, there's a lot of uh, hype right now on websites like Facebook and some of them, but they don't really generate the income because everything's free unless you want to see an ad on your iPad on your iPhone all the time people aren't going to look at that and so I think that uh, there's a hype a lot of hype about it but newspapers the ones that are doing a good job uh, are okay <clears throat> Berkshire Hathaway Warren Buffett has been buying up newspapers all over because he sees that as a good opportunity so he's buying the middle-sized newspapers uh, Tuscaloosa News uh, smaller papers than that. He, he would buy the Dalton Citizen News. He, he, he owns a lot of them right now. That's good to know. <clears throat> I think so. There's just something about sitting down in the morning with the newspaper in your hand. That's right. And and seeing what's going on. I have to check those obituaries sometime now. See, see my if you're old in there. age. That's, see if you, that's sure you're exactly not in there. right. <laughs> uh -oh. um, <clears throat> continue, let's continue talking about where you went. You were in Dalton. Okay. Dalton, I was there and, and uh, got the kids going into college and I uh, got a, got a uh, Charles Morris that owns Morris Newspaper Corporation that uh, publishes smaller dailies all over the country. He had 40, 40 daily newspapers. Uh, flew up to Dalton and, and offered me the job to be his uh, CEO. And so I took that and went, moved down to Savannah with Kathy and Benjamin, my youngest son. My oldest son was here at the, here at the university. He graduated with a music degree performance degree. Uh, and so we, we stayed in Savannah for two years and I ran the company. I, I didn't like that as much. Uh, I was in the airplane all the time, flying to Kansas and he had, we had newspapers out in California and, and I was in the airplane an awful lot. And I'd fly in there and meet with the publishers and check on them and everything and uh, then come back to Savannah, leave on Monday, come back on Friday and uh, I was just, it was a boring job to me. I like to be where I can shuffle the paper and deal with people and assign stories and, and help, help write headlines. Hands on. Hands on, that's what I enjoy. So I left that and uh, got in business with Tom Cousins and Jim Minner and we bought the uh, Clayton News Daily, which is 
uh, and it had we wound up having 13 newspapers, uh, chain of newspapers between mostly between Macon and Atlanta, but uh, Elton Hartwell, Royston, uh, St. Mary's. Uh, well, it was the Kingsland paper that I sold to Dink Smith later, and so I did that for about nine years and. Uh, Sold it to uh, sold it to CHNI to Birmingham, which is a community newspapers holdings, and retired for a year, and that's in 1998. And uh, Millard Grimes, who lives here in Athens, owned the the uh, Georgia Trend, and I was getting kind of bored. I was 55 years old, and I was uh, I, I I stayed on some boards and everything. So you'd go around the table, and somebody would say, "Oh, I'm I'm Jim Lentz. I'm president of uh, Bank of America." Uh, somebody would say, I'm so-and-so, and I'd say, well, I'm Neely Young, I don't have a job. <laughs> <laughs> so I felt like really awkward, and all my friends were still working. So this magazine came up, and I said, well, I've never done magazines before, I'm a newspaper man. But I took a chance, and I got uh, Tom Cousins to go in with, with this one, and he and I went in together and bought Georgia Trend. And it's been great, I've had it 15 years. Uh, it's a, it's a lot different, and I thought this is going to be easy. I've been putting out daily newspapers every day, and once a month, this is going to be easy, but it's not easy. <laughs> the stories are a lot more in-depth, and you've got to, you know, got to get it right. You can't make mistakes like you can make a mistake in the newspaper, and next day you retract can just write it, it retract it the next day, and you've got to be real careful with a magazine. But uh, it's been a lot of fun. And your son's gone into business with you. Have fun. Ben fine. became a partner a year and a half, two years ago, and he's he and I are publishers. And uh, Tom Cousins is kind of a silent partner, uh, and so we're we're running it. What fun working with your son! I think that'll be wonderful. It is wonderful. It is wonderful. He came over here for a summer school, so he's he's a Georgia person. And I forgot to mention that my my father came to Georgia in 1918. Is that right? Yeah. He was over here, and then my sister was here in the 50s, 8 to 60, 61, I think, 60s when she left. She was a cow here. So you've got, you've got roots. Oh, have big, deep roots. Well, that's, that's, well we're proud. <laughs> I, I, Neely, I have a list of accomplishments and accolades here that, that goes for miles. You served as president of the Georgia Press Association of the Associated Press of Georgia as chair of the Georgia Press Education Foundation. You served on the UGA Grady College of Journalism, UGA's University Press, the board of school, the board of the School of Urban Affairs at Georgia State. Uh, it goes on and on. You served as chairman of the Atlanta Regional Salvation Army, served on boards throughout Regional Leadership Foundation, Georgia Chamber of Commerce, and it goes on and on. Well, How I fine. can't say no. <laughs> <laughs> How fine. How fine. You have certainly... Um, well, one I'm most proud of is the Salvation Army work we've done. And, uh, you know, being involved with them, they're the greatest people in the world and uh, have a real mission. And uh, we... we raised enough money. One of my one of the things I headed up was we raised thirty five million dollars to redo the redo all the aging buildings and everything. And it was kind of a miracle. We the Salvation Army had never really raised more than about eight million dollars. And so we came we hired a company to go see what the what we really needed to do. And uh, they came back and said, Well y'all got a race to really refurbish all these ancient buildings that y'all got and the plumbing's bad and roofs all need to be fixed, you need twenty five million dollars and we said, There's just no way. So we started out and we hired this Cox Curry and uh, so the board raised five million dollars. We had a lot of heavy hitters on the board. And uh, then uh, then Woodruff gave us $5 million, and this is, you know, you raise part of it before you announce that you have a silent time. So this was our silent time, and then uh, another foundation gave us uh, uh, $5 million, Annie Casey Foundation, so we had $15 million. And then we got a, recru uh, a lady died that had us in her will for 30 years ago. She put it in, us in her will and she was in her 90s and she died and left us $10 million unrestricted. <laughs> so I'm sitting there going, wait a minute, we've raised the $25 million. We, it, it was like in a month and a half. In the silent stage still, <laughs> practically, didn't you? So, so we took that and, and uh, we wound up raising $10 million, you know, from Gosh. different the foundations. So that was the most of any salvation that Army that, uh, unit That's ever wonderful. raised. So I was real proud of that. I guess so. I was going to ask you what you were most proud of in your 
in your career. Talk about your family a little bit, I know. Well, I've got a wonderful wife. She's, uh, she's a, a, a dynamo and uh, she's, she just has gone off being chairman of the State Botanical Gardens here in Athens. And, Is that uh, right? And she's just really a, a go-getter and she, she's uh, in, into everything. She's on the board of Reinhardt College and uh, she's big in our church. She had a quite a distinguished career. She, as we were, I was in Dalton being publisher. She was head of volunteers for the hospital, and where we'd move around, she would uh, she would go to. We moved to Savannah. She came the head of the volunteers. It's a paid job, but you got to have a really a vibrant personality, and you were always recruit, recruiting the the pink ladies, they call them, you know. And so she she did that at Candler. And then she uh, went to work, when we moved up to Marietta Durant and lived in the Atlanta area, she ran this foundation for Wellstar, Kennestone Hospital. She started that and she's, she raised a lot of money from that. And then they asked her to come to work for our church, First Methodist Church for Marietta. And so she was the administrator for our church for five years, a 5,000 member church. And uh, so she's, she's quite a lady. And when we sold the newspapers, she retired and she's just been doing volunteer work. But somebody described her as uh, the, uh, uh, this is Kathy Young, she's the wings beneath Neely's sails. <laughs> and I said, no, she's the hurricane beneath my sails. <laughs> and then my son, uh, my oldest son is in Memphis. He's, a, he, he's followed his music career, got the degree from the University of Georgia, and he's a jazz musician over in Memphis, Memphis and done very well. And uh, my youngest son is uh, married, and I have a grandchild. Of course, that's the light of our lives, and he most works. important. Thing. That's most important. That's right. And he works. He's a co-publisher with me, and uh, does a lot of the editorial work. Uh, you know, writes a column like I do, and we we go out and mingle with things. And, uh, so life you know, is good. Yeah, lots of good. That's uh, right. Life is good. Well, I you know I know that. Uh, that you're proud of your family, and we're proud of you. We're proud that you're an alumnus of the University of Georgia. Well, thank you, thank you. Is there anything else that we need to talk about? I, I, at the bottom of that uh, outline that you're a wonderful assistant, and she is wonderful, Gail. <laughs> I said we can talk about anything we want to talk about. Is there something that comes to mind that you'd like to expound on today? Well, I think you know we, we're uh, you know kind of a crossroads in Georgia right now. This is. This is 2013, and it's going to be interesting to see where our state goes. We've had it, we've stumbled, and uh, Georgia been very fortunate to. Uh, uh, it'll be interesting to, to see what happens when somebody listens to this. But <clears throat> back in the 90s, 80s and 90s, we had this huge construction boom, and it went into the 2000 up to 2008 before the Great Recession hit. And one of the reasons we were so successful is uh, immigration. Uh, we had uh, people come in from Mexico, uh, Canada, really all over the world, India. Mostly poor people from Mexico that came across uh, illegally. They, they were just, a lot of them came over here on visas and stayed. And they did the work that made us so prosperous and made me able to build my newspaper chain up. Uh, we used a lot of Hispanics delivered the newspapers. They still do, and they still do the work and they're not appreciated in Georgia. And we passed this very draconian law about three years ago, uh, House Bill 87, which really came down on immigrants and told them and punished people that hired them. And uh, we've had all kind of immigration problems. And the, the, here we were such a welcome state with race and uh, we passed that law. And so I'm hoping that Georgia will overturn that. And I've been making that a point with our editorials and. Uh, and columns and a lot of our stories to show how that that is not a good thing for us to be. We're not Alabama. We're not uh, South Carolina back in the in the 1950s when race, racial tension was there. So I'm hoping I'd like to see that someone uh, maybe 10 or 15 years from now will come in and maybe see our this interview and I hope things have changed and I think they will. God is good to us and they, they God welcomes everyone and Georgia should welcome everyone.